Let's go to the word of prayer. Father God, Lord, we thank you today for bringing us here and uh, giving us the opportunity to hear a word from you. It's a privilege and an honor to be able to know that, that you will minister to us and that you will speak to us and that you brought us here. Or that there is no there is no accident that we're here. That you brought us here for a reason. And that if we will allow ourselves to focus on you, if we will allow ourselves to really uh, get in your presence, that there's no way we will leave here the same way we came in. And Lord, you're going to breathe some things into our life. You're going to speak some things over us that we need to hear. Things that are going to alter our life. Things that, things that are going to alter our situation. You're going to give us what we need when we need it. And so, Lord, may we focus on you. May we not be distracted by things happening around us, things happening later today. But for just a few moments, really, we'll lean in on you. Lord, we pray these things in your holy, your precious, and mighty name. Amen. I'm really glad you're here today. I know it's the, the weekend after Thanksgiving. There's a ton of people traveling, but you're here. And I'm really glad that you're here because uh, this is a big day. This is the conclusion of the road ahead. We've been in this series for roughly eight to ten weeks. I feel like we've been here forever. Uh, and maybe you don't, but I do. I'm really looking forward to uh, next week. I'm looking forward to December. I'm looking forward to our Christmas series that will begin next week. You won't want to miss any of the services throughout December. I'm looking forward to Christmas Eve. Uh, we're going to blink, and it's going to be the 24th of December. You better start shopping. You know, you better get it done. Traffic's only going to get worse, which is going to bring out the Jesus in you, right? Uh, the lines are only going to get worse, and uh, it's going to get tougher and tougher. And so we're going to talk about a lot of these things over the next couple weeks. Because God, God speaks a lot of things about the holidays. He talks about how we are just survive the most wonderful time of year and uh, and how we're going to deal with the emotions that come with all that. But today, we are concluding this series, and we're going to be concluding the book of Ruth. Many of you know we've been in the book of Esther, we've been in the book of Ruth, and what we have seen is we've seen a lot of dark uh, and troublesome times. We've seen a lot of hurdles, we've seen a lot of obstacles, we've seen a lot of ups, and we've seen a lot of downs. But through it all, God has been, uh, he's up, been up to something through all these circumstances, and there's been this parallel, this, this idea, and this truth that God says to you and me that even though that we have dark times, and we have ups and downs, and we have obstacles, and we have hurdles, he's at work constantly. And so if you haven't been around here, let me give you a quick Cliff Notes version. If you just looked on the link for the first time, maybe you're just walking in here for the first time, here it is. I'll give you the quick version. What we've seen is first a family of four move from a place called Bethlehem to a place called Moab. It was like it was night and day. It would like be it would be like leaving the middle of Idaho and moving to Manhattan. It, it would be night and day. And so they left Bethlehem and they went to Moab. A family of four. That's what we met. They quickly uh, that family quickly becomes one. Now, before that family became one, the two daughters of this family get married. And that was. Uh, a lady by the name, uh, they married two ladies by the name of Ruth and, and Orpha, and, and, and Naomi, she's the one who was left solo. Um, she calls her daughter-in-laws in, and she goes, look, girls, uh, you need a man. And uh, Orpha rolls out and says, I got it. I want a man. I'm going after him. Ruth says, no, no, Naomi, it's you and me. We've lost everything, and we're going to do this together. You know, it's just the two of us. We can make it if we try, just the two of us. And you and uh, you know Song. You have no idea what I just said, but there you have it. And so uh, they end up going back uh, to Bethlehem. Uh, even though Ruth had never been there, she, she goes to Bethlehem with Naomi. And it's there that they are struggling. They're poor, and they, they got to eat. And so they do this thing called gleaning. Ruth has to go out and glean. It, it's begging, essentially, but it's not begging because what they're actually doing is they're actually walking around working in fields picking up scraps that they were allowed to pick up. That's what the gleaning is. And so Ruth is doing that. And in, in this, she's in this field of this guy by the name of Boaz. And, uh, and she, she takes one look at Boaz. And she goes, hey, uh, this is, uh, I just met you. And this is crazy. But here's my number. Call me maybe. I, 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 you know, that's, that's another song. Some of you have no clue. But she, she's like, I like that. And he's like, are you kidding me? This is awesome. I'm old. You're young. You're good looking. I'm not so much so. You're a woman of integrity. Yes, 
oh snap, there's a problem. There's somebody who has dibs on you. And he's like, I gotta deal with that first. Let me go get rid of that loser. And then I'm gonna marry you just as quick as I can, baby doll. And that's exactly where we are. Is that okay? I'll get it? Yeah. yeah. That is probably the worst version of telling the story. But for those of you who know this story, it's not too bad. He is finally in a position to redeem her and to marry her. And this is where we are in the fourth chapter. We pick up in verse 13. Let's read verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. Very, very powerful verse right there. Knowing what she had gone through. And he went in to her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Now, some of you are like, well, that's a you know, weird verse. The Bible has to be so clear and so explicit. But the Bible is actually painting a beautiful, beautiful image here. This is a beautiful picture. And what you just read, you just read an example of total, not partial, not some, total redemption. This is a total redemptive moment. This is the moment where it's complete. This is the moment that it all comes together. This is an awesome moment. I want you to think about this. Ruth, she went from widowed to married. She went from begging to provided for. She went from barren to popping out babies. This is this moment the author is communicating to you and me victory. The author is communicating celebration. The author is communicating to you and me that God gets it done. And this is a point right here that has become very foreign to you and me and the society we live in. And what I mean by that is, is that we live in a world and a society that, in my opinion, really loses sight on victory. And what I mean by that is, is that we live in a society and a world that would have read through Ruth, that would have read through Esther, and had a very different idea of how things should have gone down, and would not have celebrated and sought victory, but rather, when things got loose, when things got crazy, would have said what? The world would have said, give up. As soon as everything falls apart, you're the victim. As soon as everything falls apart, your world, you should be negative. You should be nasty. You should have a pity party. You should be depressed. You should be anxious. You should embrace all of these emotions. You should just throw in the towel. That's, that's, what, that's what we do. That's what the world around us encourages. It, it encourages us to just accept failure and to and essentially ignore the reality that God is at work in our life. That, that's what society does. And so every step of the way for Ruth and Naomi, every step of their journey, we have seen a lot of obstacles. We have seen a lot of not so ideal situations, yet we have seen celebration because God's at work. Even in getting married and having children here in verse 13. Look at this. And, and, and they, they got married and the Lord gave them a child. We live in a world that actually views marriage as a mistake. There, there has been a massive shift. It's, it's, it's funny. I, I used to do weddings like literally all the time. All the time. All the time. And it was actually overwhelming. I, 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 I came to a point where I was like, yeah, no, I just learned a word. It's a really good word that many of us need to learn. No. You know, you, anybody ever need to learn to say no? But I mean, literally, it was always like, can you do this wedding? Can you do this wedding? Can you do that wedding? Can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? And it's like, no, 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 no. Every single weekend, it's like, I, there were weekends I would do two or three weddings in one Saturday, joking around, because everybody was getting married. And then all of a sudden, something changed. There's been a shift. Now, some of the ability to say no, but there is a different shift in the culture. And the culture has become that marriage is, is it's really just not that important. That nobody gets married anymore. Because it's viewed as a mistake. It's funny. I, I literally was talking with some college kids a few weeks ago that, that, that was talking about marriage and, and the concept of marriage. And it was, it was like this idea of everyone, <laughs> this is great, everyone feels that everyone should have the right to get married, but everyone feels like it's this big mistake. So it's like, okay, you, have the, you should have the right to get married, but they would tell you don't do it. Don't go and get that old bowl and chain. That's the view of, of marriage. 
Yeah. You know, you know what our problem is. Our problem with marriage is, is that the marriage, the viewpoint. Many of us look at marriage as burdensome and exhausting and handcuffing and a lot of work. But that's because it is. The work part, not the handcuff part. <laughs> marriage is, is it's tough, but can I tell you something? Marriage done right is amazing. Because, because that's how God designed it. That's, he, he, he said it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for a woman to be alone. He's like, you need each other. It's a, when, how many of you know when you, because you've had that moment, maybe you're not in one right now, but you've been in a moment where you have had a really good relationship. It, it, it's just like you can't get enough of them, right? Y'all know what it's like. Remember when you first started dating? And it was like, you really like that person? And then three months later, it's like, ugh, you know? What happened to that person that was like the three-day-old relationship? You see, there, the, 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 let me tell you the problem. The problem with marriage is this. You know what makes all the difference in marriage? Do you know how to fix your marriage? It's very simple. You don't need to go to a marriage conference. You don't need to spend hours and hours and hours upon counseling. You don't need to spend hours and hours and hours upon research of books. Do you know what you need to do to fix your marriage? It's one word. I'm going to tell you the word that's on the screen behind me. God. If he is the center of your relationship, if he is the center of your relationship, don't, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about you, then everything will be amazing. Because what's going to happen is if you have the attributes of God, if you are patient like God, if you are loving like God, if you are caring like God, if you are long-suffering like God, if you put your needs on the back burner as God did, do you know no one is going to have a problem loving you? Now, many of us know the problem with that is that sometimes the other person, they, they, they don't do that, do they? Now, that's another sermon for another. We'll do that later. Maybe January. We'll have some fun. <laughs> Fix everybody's life, right? <laughs> now that was a bonus. We gotta keep going. Right? You're like, what was all that about? We gotta keep going. Verse 14. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be pre-owned. Listen, listen throughout all of Israel. Now what the Bible says is this is pretty cool. I said the women of the town, let's, let's talk about what we just read. They catch wind of Ruth. They catch wind of this baby. They catch wind of all the things that's going on, of all the things that are coming, all the things that are happening. And they come to her, and what does the Bible say? It says they encouraged her. And they begin to point her to the one who made all this possible. They, they said, blessed be the Lord. Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. Blessed be the Lord who brought you a husband. Blessed be the name of the Lord who brought you a provider. Blessed be the name of the Lord who has now granted you with a child. Now, you, many of you remember in week one that we asked this question, what role does God play in our life? What role does God play in our circumstances? We asked this question, and we, we, we asked this question, just how involved is he? Is, is some of this just by chance? Is some of this by luck? Is, is some of this by coincidence? Or, or, is God involved in everything? And throughout this series, many of you have said to me, through email, at the back door, through phone calls and texts, that your opinions have changed. That your opinion has changed. That, that you really do recognize now that God has something to do with everything. And this is something that, if that's all you got from this series, awesome. Because it's the truth. God has something to do with everything. Our stupidity, the good, the bad, the ugly, our successes, our failures, everything in between, God has something to do with it all. And these ladies, they say, listen, the Lord has not left you this day. I love these words because this was very intentional when you look at the Bible, because this was a reminder right here. This is a reminder, I think we need to remember this, that how Naomi showed up to town. So these ladies step in and they remind her of something. You remember Naomi showed up in town and she goes, no, no, you were to call me Myra. You were to call me, that's my new name. My new name is Myra. My new name is Bitter. I am bitter. I am hurt. I am, I, I am negative, I'm nasty, and don't you dare put that on me. I am not the same woman that you knew. 
I'm not the blessed woman with the husband and with the boys. I'm not the blessed woman with the children, the picket fence, and the show dogs. I am not that person anymore. It's all been stripped from me. And these women, they step in and they speak into an emotionally bruised, beaten, battered person of Naomi. A person who felt that he had, that God had forsaken her. And they encourage her to the, and they say, do not forget of our sovereign God who has not forsaken you. What's the point? Why do I bring this up? This is what true friends do. When we read this, I think it's important. This is what true friends do. Every one of you are here for a reason. Some of you maybe want to reassess who your friends are. Because your friends, the people who honestly care about you, the people who honestly are best for you, the people who you need to have in your life, are people who are going to encourage you. You need encouragers in your life who are going to point you to him, not them, not that person, not this way, not that way. People that are not going to be negative, nasty, and, and, and tell you to have a pity, pity party, tell you to throw in the towel, tell you to quit, tell you to go this way or that. No, you're going to, what you need is true friends that encourage you and point you back to who the Lord is. That God is always at work. That God is always sovereign. That he's in control of, of anything and everything that is going on. So the, the, let's get back to the text. The, the ladies keep talking. Verse 15. And he shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons. What, a, what an awesome compliment has given birth to him. She goes, yeah, you, you, you lost two boys. Yeah, you did. But Ruth is better than having seven of those boys. And I love, I love this statement. The Bible says that, 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 that he shall be a restorer of your life and a nourisher of, in your old age. What is the Bible saying? What the Bible is saying is that these ladies said this baby brought you new life. How many of you uh, grandmas and uh, grandpas are in here? Let me ask you a question. Did your grandchildren bring new life to you? I mean, let's just be honest. They make you young again, don't they? You really enjoy them. You do. They do. They, 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 those, they, you like you liked your kids, but you love your grandkids. <laughs> Preston, you can go back and sit with mommy. Go ahead. <laughs> They bring, they bring something to your life that those kids didn't bring. They, 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 and so many times, Grandma and Grandpa, I don't know how many of you know this, I've worked with a lot of people that become empty nesters, and they look at each other and they're like, now i got to deal with you? I want my kids back. And then come the grandbabies. They, they come to grandbabies and they bring this life back into it. And, and this is what they're saying. It says this baby is going to bring nourishment to your body, bring nourishment to your life. It's going to give you a fresh meaning again. Look at verses 16 and 17. Then Naomi took the child, laid him on her lap, and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. His father, he, he was the father of Jesse and the father of David. Now, this word nurse, I think some of you immediately thought, okay, Naomi's nursing him. Like, we think of nursing, we think of, like, breastfeeding and all that. That's not what, what's happening here. This word, you could, some of your Bibles probably already replaced it. Instead of nursing, it, it actually, the word that might be used would, would be, like, supporter or caregiver. Uh, it might be provider. What Naomi was doing was she was committing the rest of her life. I love this to the well-being of that child. How many of you would like a live-in nanny? <laughs> That's what she was doing. She was committed. Grandma was saying, I am going to give my focus, my energy, I'm taking care of that child. Everything that child needs. All my energy, all my effort. Now the next person appears that the neighbors name the kid. And I mean, that's what the Bible just said. It says the, the, the neighbors name the kid. Can I tell you something? This is a good biblical word of advice. Don't let your neighbors name your kid. Because you're going to end up with a name like open. They're going to think it's funny or something. But actually, it's, it's, it, the, the name, what, what's important about it is the meaning. And that's why they named him open. They named him open because open means servant. And it meant servant. And what they were doing when they named him 
was they were committing from day one that his life was not going to be about his own. That from day one, his life was going to be about serving. It was going to be a life of, of servanthood. He was not going to be the main character of his life. He was going to be the supporting character of a bigger story. And see, this is something that we need to understand as we read this, this chapter today. As we read, as we read this, this passage of the Bible. You see, here, here's the thing. As we read this passage of the Bible, as we read Ruth, I, I want us to push on this a little bit. We have been reading these stories of Ruth and Esther, and we've been exploring these situations, and we've been watching TV, as I like to call it. When we read the Bible, it's like watching a movie. It's like watching a television show. And here's the thing. You have a main character, you have main characters, and then you have supporting characters. And many of us, we like to be, we like to be the main character. I mean, we, that, that's who we focus on. That's who gets all the attention. And all the major movies, it's like, you know, the, oh, that's the movie Brad Pitt's in. Oh, that's the movie that Julia Roberts is in. Oh, that's the movie, and you throw out those names. But in those movies that we reference, there's like a ton of great actors and actresses in there, aren't there? There's a bunch of them. But you're not throwing out, you know, oh, Tom Ford's in that movie, and you know, Sarah McDaniel's in that movie. It's like, who are they? Everyone wants to just focus on the main character, but the reality is, is that there are smaller supporting characters in these movies, and the reality is, is that that's what we are. We're, we're supporting characters in, in a bigger picture. We're, we're not the main characters. We like to make ourselves the main characters. Every one of us wants to have a movie picture of us, right? So that, that's how I blow up my day. Most of my days, it's like, yeah, it's me, you know? Anybody else? Do you walk through the mall and be like, yeah, everybody's looking at me? <laughs> no? Okay, just me? Okay, it's all right. I, I feel like, do, do you feel like the main character? I mean, if you go to work, it's like, this place can't make it without me. Anybody else? Yeah? You're the main character. But the reality is, you're, you're supporting character. If there's something bigger going on. And in verse 17, we see a major shift in the story. It's through a statement that broadens the spectrum and shifts the focus of the story. And we see the great results of Boaz and Ruth's faithfulness to God. Obed, the guy we just got named, grows up and he has his own family. And he is the son named, he has a son, he, he has a son named Jesse. Obed has kids of his own. Then the very next book of the Bible, in 1 Samuel, we see that uh, the Bible says that the very next chapter, God sends a prophet to find a, very, a, 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 a prophet to find the next king of Israel. And he goes to Obed's son's house, Jesse, where he finds a young man by the name of David, who becomes the next king of Israel. Not just the next king, the, the most powerful king of the most powerful nation, the greatest king, just read history, who built a nation to become a powerhouse. He was a warrior. He was a musician. He was a politician. He was a great leader. The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. That's David. And David was the great grandchild of Ruth and Boaz. Now, why is that important? It's important because we need to understand Ruth and Boaz were, they were normal people. They were normal people like you and me. Again, I am not calling you normal because you are not. But we are normal people. Most of us don't really have superpowers or super, you know, super skills with a Z. We're pretty normal. Ruth and Boaz were normal like you and me, and God used them. God used their darkness. He used their stress. He used their drama. He used their struggles. He used their trials. He used their, their, their storms. He used everything in between to three generations later to transform a nation, to transform a people, and this is the best part, to transform history as you and I know it. What's the point? God knows what he's doing. This is the point. God knows what he's doing all the time. I'm sure Ruth and Naomi didn't sit at their husband's funerals 
sitting there with a smile on their face saying, man, God is up to something. And good things are coming. This is awesome. I'm sure they didn't. I'm sure as Ruth was out in the field gleaning and picking up scraps, I'm sure Ruth wasn't sitting there saying, man, this is unbelievable how awesome this moment is. I'm sure God is at work as I pick up these scraps. This is this great that God has got something in store. I'm sure they weren't sitting there thinking that God is going to use my situation to utterly transform history. That God is going to use my grandchild to transform history. Because why? Because all they saw was darkness. All they saw was obstacles. All they saw was pain and suffering, but yet God was behind the scenes doing what needs to be done. What is the point? God can use your dark hour and your dark situations to do what needs to be done. And see, this has been something that over the last eight weeks that God has been trying to communicate to somebody, all of us, that even though we're not in the best situation, even though that we are faced with some really messed up things, maybe the relationship we have is an absolute shamble. Maybe we don't have a relationship. Maybe our career is just falling apart. Maybe we don't even have a career. Maybe our health, maybe our finances, maybe our sanity and our mind, whatever it is, just everything doesn't make sense. Yet God says, I'm at work. Even though you're sitting at the funeral, you're sitting at the death of whatever situation you're dealing with, God is very much at work. Let's finish the book. Verses 18 through 22. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hazred. Hazred fathered Ram. Ram fathered Amadab. Amadab fathered Nashem. Nashem fathered Sal Salmon. Solomon and Solomon followed Boaz. Boaz followed Obed. Obed followed Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. Now, many of you would have just skipped that part of Ruth for multiple reasons. You're like, okay, I can't pronounce half those names, and those names don't really matter. And you would just be like, that was a good story, and move on. But actually, this book finishes very strongly, and it shows us something. It finishes with the genealogy. It finishes with the lineage of the family tree. It actually doesn't stop there. The family tree continues into Matthew, the first chapter. Let's read it. Matthew 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. That right there should be your attention. The son of David, the son of Abraham. The son of Solomon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. And Jacob, the father, just the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, you just met the main character of this story. The main character of Ruth wasn't Boaz. It wasn't Ruth. But it was Ruth's book. Yeah, doesn't matter. She was not the main character of this movie. She was not the main character of this story. The main character of this story was Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. You see, the Bible just told us that Ruth and Boaz were direct relatives in the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Through this story, through the story that we just learned about them, they were just supporting characters. They were just supporting characters in this story. They were a small part of something bigger. You see, our story, yours and mine, it's a small part of a bigger story. I believe this is how God wanted us to conclude this. I believe this is what God wanted all of us to hear as we conclude Esther, as, as we conclude Ruth. And that is this. Your life is not about you. Oh, that's harsh. To realize that this is not about you. We are not the main character. Yet we live as such. And I'm going to tell you why we live as such. 
I'm going to tell you why you think you're a maker. Even though you may not walk through the mall like I talked about. Even though you may not walk into work like I talked about. The reason why many of us think that we are the main character, why we think that this is all about us, is because as soon as life happens, as soon as darkness falls, as soon as trouble happens, what do we do? We cry, we cry out these words, why me? Why are you doing this to me? God, why are you doing this to me? Why am I so unhappy? Why am I still single? Why is this marriage falling apart? Why am I having to deal with this constant drama? Why am I constantly arguing? Why is it I can't sleep? Why is it I can't eat? Why is it that this cancer won't go away? Why is it that my child is having to go through these things? Why is it that I am having to deal with this junk at work? Can one more thing break this week? Can one more thing go wrong? Can I have one more bill? Can I have one more bit of bad news? We do this all the time, and what we are doing is we are making it about ourselves. When we just need to recognize that we're the supporting characters, the, the question really should be, why not? Why not bring it? Why not bring the darkness? Why not bring the troubles? Why not bring the obstacles? Because the reality is, why, why not ask that? Because here's the truth. We've all said week after week that God does his best work in the darkest hours. Yet we shake our fists and curse those dark hours. We sit here and we say God does his best work in the dark hours, yet we shake our fists at the dark hours. Because we forget that we're not the main character. We forget that we're the supporting characters, that it's not about us, it's not about our life. It's not about our comfort, it's about him. And what he says is, he says, listen, I step in and I turn what looks to be a dark, nasty, negative situation. When you're sitting at the funeral of this thing, when you're sitting at the funeral of that thing, when you're sitting at the death of this thing, and sitting at the death of that thing, and you feel like everything is falling apart. When you sit there time and time and time again, listen, we know this happens every week. Every day, every month, that phone call, that obstacle, that trial, that email, whatever it might be, God steps in time and time again, and he does what needs to be done. So what, it, what needs to happen? You and I need to change our viewpoint. We need to change the viewpoint that, it is, that we are not the main character. We're supporting characters. So that when our life is getting disrupted, we are like, okay, well, God's at work. God's just... He's making a story. He is stepping in and he is doing something. He's the main character. This is how this, we, the, this series is called The Road Ahead. This is, we've seen this week after week after week. The Road Ahead is always recognizing the fact that there is something bigger than you, that you are a small part of a bigger story, and that God is in control. That if God puts somebody in your life, it's for a reason. If God takes somebody out of your life, it's for a reason. If God opens a door in your life, it's for a reason. If God slams the door shut, it's for a reason. If God has you turn left, it's for a reason. If he has you turn right, it's for a reason. If he gives you that busted up tire, if that, if that car that breaks down, if he gives you whatever it might be, the traffic jam that you set on on Route 3 that we can't stand, it's for a reason. It's like, this is the little things, right? I mean, we shake our fist at it. I was standing in line at Macy's the other day. There was three people in line. It doesn't take long to check out three people, does it? It shouldn't. But they got to ask, do you want a clever Macy's card? Do you have any coupons today? And then they got to put all those return stickers on there, right? Have you seen that, anybody? No? Okay. Well, so you sit there, and it's like five minutes, 10 minutes, you know, 11 minutes, 12 minutes. Every minute is like a, a, a waking hour. And I'm standing there, and I'm literally having sweat run down my arms because I'm shaking because I'm getting angry. Now, anybody else? <laughs> I am about the only one. <laughs> then I was reminded of the sermon. Uh, like, thank God. This isn't about you, Jason. You're standing here for a reason. There's no one here that needs you right now. All oh, everybody needs them. Unlike you, you do not want me to work right now. This is 
not. This isn't one of those moments. This isn't it. And you know what? He held me there long enough because he wanted me to see somebody. And there was somebody that was walking by that I hadn't seen in a very long time that just needed to pour out their heart. And if I had been gone, if, I, if they had done their job and stopped offering everybody a cutie on the coupon and the credit card, I would have been gone. But God said, I want you there. Stop. This isn't about me, Jason. It's about somebody else who's going to be walking down this aisle in a few minutes that I need you to talk to. There's reasons why you're sitting in the doctor's office. There's reasons why you're sitting on Route 3, why you're sitting in the drive-thru line. We are a small part of the bigger story. And I, I believe that if we can change the way we do things, the way we view what we go through, the road ahead will be a lot easier. Because here's the thing that I have found to be true, and I think that you would probably agree with me. The road ahead really makes sense. Anybody else? You ever look at your life like, yeah, this doesn't really make that much sense. You look at the person you're with, and you're like, hmm, didn't think it would be this one, but uh, they're a good role play, right? You look at your kids, and you're like, this is what I got. <laughs> the career. You're like, this is my job. This is what I do. This is the life I live. And so many times it doesn't make sense that the obstacles we deal with, it's like, seriously, yet again, God, am I having to deal with this? They're rarely ideal. But with Esther, and we see again with Ruth, and we see it in our lives every single day, so many things don't make sense. They're not ideal. These dark seasons, these disappointments, these obstacles, these walls, these chains that you have, these weights that you carry, the hurt that you carry, the pain you carry, the trouble you're encountering. It doesn't make sense, but it doesn't have to. Uh, you. You're a small part of the bigger story. Now, I could stand here for three hours and explain to you a thousand passages where God tells you why that's okay. But I think I'm just going to say one statement. God knows what he's doing. And so you either believe that or you don't. If you believe God knows what he's doing, then you realize your darkness, your disappointment, your obstacles, your walls, your change, your weights, your hurt, your pain, your trouble, for a reason. Just like with Esther and Ruth, it's for a reason. And he is going to get you into a place that you could have never got yourself. He's going to bless you in areas you never could have been blessed. Just let him be the main character. And embrace what he wants to do. Let's pray together. Father God, Lord, I thank you today for our time. I thank you today for this passage. And I thank you for the time that you've had in Esther. And as we bring it to a conclusion, Lord, may we come to the understanding and recognition, Lord, that we are a small part of a larger story. That, Lord, when we have things falling apart in our life, when we have dark seasons in our life, when we are up against walls, when we are entangled in chain, when we are weighted down by burdens, when we're carrying the load of our family, of our relationship or lack thereof, as we carry the load of our children and our careers, our finances and our health, as we get those calls, those text messages, those emails, as we're surrounded by trauma and stress, Lord, all of it, all the darkness, it's just a curtain curtain at a, at a play. Lord, you're behind the curtain. You're behind the scenes orchestrating and setting up things that need to be done. You're setting up the things that need to occur in our life. Lord, we are your children. We are the supporting cast of the bigger story. And what is wonderful is you always want what's best for us. Not, not all things seem best. These, these things that we go through, they don't seem good. But Lord, you have shown 
since the dawn of day, page after page in the documentation of history, that you always show up and do what's best. And so, Lord, right now, may you breathe into our spirits the peace that has all understanding. May we embrace who you are, Lord. We pray these things in your holy, your precious, and your mighty name. Amen.